session. Uh, first session will be moderated by the head of SCAP sub-regional office, Ms. Sandy Fong Toy, um, and she will, I will pass the mic to her to introduce the session and also to introduce the um, presenters and the lead discussants. Sandy Fong Toy, you have the floor. Very much, uh, and thank you very much, everyone, for coming back uh, so early from Morning Peak. I think my energy has been up to about 30, so I'm very stressed. Um, but that will ensure that we have to find more discussions. Um, so, as the first chair, my name is Andy Fong Toy. I'm the head of the SCAP uh, sub regional office of the Pacific Basin Museum. And it's a real pleasure uh, to be here at this meeting, uh, and in particular to welcome those of you who are not part of um, so, uh, in this session, we will explore Arctic perspectives, explore how to move together to make the circuit and the SDGs, and how this national focal point can harmonize the efforts uh, in implementation. Um, we will also touch uh, on uh, how we can also implement the sector use across the different regions uh, and on integrated planning and implementation strategies using the best practices from the Sahara pathway of this uh, During this session, uh, we will hear from uh, national focal points as they share the lessons learned from their work in localizing the Samoa pathway. And finally, we will begin exploring potential partnerships and collaborations that can help drive this simple implementation of Atlas. And it's really great to see, I think, uh, our development partners uh, in uh, a large number this morning. So let me uh, start by introducing uh, our esteemed uh, presenters. Uh, so uh, for this session, uh, we will kick off with uh, uh, Ambassador Gutierrez, and that's the far more uh, to the UN Chair of Aerosis, and I'm sure all of us in this room know uh, Ambassador Gutierrez very well. We also have Ms. Rita White, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Barbados to the UN, and an uh, and, and Aerosis Bureau member. And of course, uh, Christian Francis, head of the uh, program uh, at UN OHR. So, just uh, before I get the floor for the presenters, uh, just to let you know that our presenters will have about seven to ten minutes for their presentation, uh, and then we will open the floor for our interactive discussion. Uh, so, let me first give the floor uh, to the best of the presentation. If you think the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just to uh, say that uh, basically I'm here in my role as the chair of the Alliance of Small United States. And therefore, it's of critical importance to us that the issue of implementation of efforts should be at the forefront. But I am also uh, representing my country, but I'm not a national focal point. So, just to make that clear, I'm gonna, my presentation is gonna be uh, three levels. Firstly, the context. Second, is how we can harmonize implementation uh, and the various global processes that are important for us to ensure that we input the address in those uh, processes. And then finally, uh, your role as uh, national focal point in the uh, implementation uh, process, as well as in the uh, monitoring and evaluation project. So those are the three main part uh, of my presentation and I'll go over it very quickly. I have to say that firstly, the issue of what happens, we all, it's, it's ours. We own that process. And what I mean by that is the outcome document on single trial came out of three regional seminars that were held in each of our three sub-regions. And then we came together in a couple of work in the inter-region and therefore we put all of those together. So what happened is the process of going from regional to uh, basically all six levels 
and then therefore we had to receive a crop. That was then protected uh, through the T77 and China process. So we're going to 39 countries to 79, sorry, 78 plus uh, China. And I think that is the process, the developmental process was then the next phase. The only thing I want to say at this stage is that going through those process, uh, we had our ambition. But as all of you are aware, negotiation is about compromise. And that is what happened within the UN process. So we never got everything we wanted. Uh, and I will, as I go through my presentation, uh, I will perhaps touch on some of the issues that we have to face in terms of the challenges. So that is the process that therefore we went through uh, and think of. And that's where our leaders endorse the efforts. So we've gone through the official process. Now I want to just very quickly go through what is contained in the document. Firstly, chapter one. Chapter one speaks to primarily our experience where we've been from the Barbados to Mauritius to Samoa and then to Antigua and Barbuda. So that is captured in chapter one, but also our special circumstances, which is critically important in the context of small island states. Chapter two then is about aspiration, our aspiration. Um, and when you go through it, there are four main areas, and you can go through those. I'm not going to go over that because uh, we do not have the time. But what was was interesting was that when we went through the negotiation process uh, at the UN, there were other countries that was telling us what our aspirations should be, what our priorities should be, and we found them very. Uh, interesting and strange that other people know more about what we should aspire to than ourselves. So aspiration is chapter two. Chapter three is primarily the vehicle of how we get to where we want to be. And there are 11, sorry, 10 action clusters uh, in that chapter. And that's the most important one because I think this is really the chapter where our partners' contribution are extremely important because they will say to us, yes, if you want this particular aspiration to be realized, this is what we can do. This is how we can help. And therefore, that is an extremely important chapter because it deals with action. And that is something that we deliberately decided at the start of the program. financial institution and also our world banks, the private sector, civil society are also critical in this process as we see. And then finally, chapter five is about monitoring and evaluation uh, uh, framework, which uh, towards the end, I think you have an extremely important role to play uh, in that process. Moving on to the second part of my presentation, and this is the harmonization of the implementation of APAS and the global processes. I think what we need to realize is that the endorsement and approval of APAS is the first step. The most important step is its implementation, and we are already five months out 
since the endorsement in Antigua and Barbuda. By next year, we will only have nine years left. I want to raise those points because I want to highlight the critical importance of implementation and ensure that we minimize the gap between Antigua and Barbuda and the start of implementation of efforts. Because the longer we have to, the longer they are, the less effective we will be in terms of the implementation uh, process. So I think we, we really do need uh, to keep that uh, in mind. So how do we avoid then uh, widening the gaps in implementation? Uh, from our other program of action that I already mentioned uh, earlier on, the uh, Barbados plan of action, the emergency strategies, the Sama pathways, and now we have uh, the anti Barbuda uh, efforts. Firstly, I think we, uh, we need to agree uh, on the level of action and partnership that can truly charge uh, a cause for resilient prosperity all our community. And I emphasize the, the phrase uh, resilient uh, prosperity because some of you, as you will recall, that is was the theme of the uh, Antigua and Barbuda uh, conference. Secondly, I think we need to sustain partnership uh, that underpins international cooperation. Uh, I think one of the big lessons that we've learned from the last 30 years is that working in silo is not the way to go. It, it, because our problems are all interconnected. And therefore, if we work in silo, my view, uh, we will not be uh, as effective. Uh, and this is where I refer to uh, partnership, whether they are with our donors, with the private sectors, with our youth, uh, with civil society, all of them are important. But the challenge for us here is to ensure that we harmonize and coordinate our partnership and implementation. We don't want to just focus on, for example, uh, the private sector, the UN development system, for example, and very critical, or just our partners. I think we need to look at all of this and agree on how we can also avoid the implication of action. And in this, uh, in, in this part, uh, for example, with uh, our partners, I've already started the process. Uh, with the European Union, for example. Uh, we would be meeting with all the 27 ambassadors of uh, the European Union next month, with all the ambassadors of EOSIS, to see how the European Union as a group can help in the implementation of others. But we're not going to stop there. We will also be talking with our partners like the UK, uh, the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, for example, they are all critical uh, to the process. So let's uh, look at those. The other uh, issue I want to raise under this uh, heading is the operationalization of the center of excellence. I think some of you have heard of this. There are primarily four main areas which we need to focus. Uh, First, the issue of tax sustainability. Uh, secondly, the issue of data, which is a huge challenge in all of the countries. Thirdly, technology and innovation. And then finally, the issue of investment. And then on the first, the data and investment, just to uh, connect this with another issue of small island development state, as uh, you probably realize. And that is the issue of the multi-dimensional vulnerability index. I think that has been mentioned, and I think, again, that is something that we cannot uh, allow 
uh, to go on the wayside. I think we all need to continue in our advocacy and ensuring that that is implemented uh, as soon as possible. And then uh, finally, on the harmonization of implementation, uh, we do integrate uh, efforts into the various uh, processes at the international level, as well as ongoing uh, agreements and framework. So, for example, the uh, Pact of the Future, uh, some of you will, will be aware that uh, EOS is had to fight very hard to ensure that a lot of our issues are included. If you look at the Pact of the Future, there are five main thematic areas, uh, and they all include uh, issues that are important uh, to us. So, we need to take out some more. Uh, COP29 in terms of financing, uh, some of you will be aware that we need to fight that battle in terms of financing, especially for climate change. So the new collective fund uh, goal for climate finance, that is a critically important issue for us. And we need to be there. Uh, and we have uh, coordinated meetings uh, up to uh, COP29. So your support in that area is also uh, important. Uh, we also have the Sendai framework, uh, as well as financing for development, uh, which will take place uh, in Shia. So all those are important, and we will need to continue uh, to advocate uh, for our issues to be included. And then finally, your role uh, in terms of uh, these various uh, purposes. Um, I think the first point I want to uh, raise with you is the, the implementation of Abbas must be aligned with set context and priorities. I think this is extremely important uh, and as national important point. I think you're well placed uh, to make sure that that is the, the case. And I think uh, avoiding uh, duplication, uh, you know, with other existing processes is also very important. Uh, this is where you can play a, an invaluable and pivotal role by ensuring that others is closely aligned with your national community suitable to local context and harmonize with national, regional, and international process. May I uh, be bold enough to suggest that uh, as a national football point, uh, you will be the champions of Abbas because you are uh, very much well positioned in the local context and that is, at the end of the day, it's about implementation on the ground. There's nothing more important than that. Many of you will also be instrumental in overseeing the monitoring and evaluation framework. So I think that's the second role that I see, uh, and that is to ensure that we uh, measure and the process for measuring uh, progress is a meaningful and reflects tangible process on the ground. Again, I'm emphasizing action on the ground because that's really what we do. And that is really the key in terms of all of this is implementation uh, on the ground. You will be integral uh, to also the study of the uh, interagency task force. Uh, this is the task force that is leading the process on the MNE uh, framework. So uh, I see a critical role for you in terms of your uh, link and uh, perhaps uh, working with uh, that particular uh, task force. 
in closing as important players in the implementation process. I take the uh, opportunity to thank you all for your active uh, engagement and commitment to advance the implementation of APRES within your respective uh, countries uh, and region. I, I look forward to uh, your reflection on how we can work together to galvanize action that will bring about the necessary transformative changes that our people have envisioned for themselves and for our system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Terry, for your very insightful and comprehensive uh, presentation, reminding us that now that uh, you know we have an other framework, it is all about implementation, and especially the contextualization uh, of implementation and the importance of activity uh, on the ground. Uh, so now uh, it's my pleasure uh, to turn to our second presenter, uh, Ms. Marita White, and you have the floor. Thank you so much. Good morning to colleagues. Good morning to um, persons here. And thank you to Grant Latu for the wonderful hospitality um, that you've displayed so far. Coming after Ambassador Lutero, um, as well as Clapham's video here, I, I really don't know what more there is for me to say, but I might attempt to, to say it. Um, so uh, the topic this morning is unpacking Abbas. Um, so I'll just walk you through the slide that we have here. Um, so what I will attempt to do, I'll um, just set up four points. Um, the first will be the introduction and context of Abbas. Um, then we'll move to key objectives and goals of Abbas. Um, and then Abbas as a distinct framework within global alignment. And then the fourth point will be support and enabling mechanisms for implementation. So moving then to the introduction, as the ambassador said before, the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SIDS, the ABAS, was adopted this year during the SIDS Board Conference uh, in May. And it builds on the legacies before it. These include the Barbados Program of Action, the POA, the Mauritius Strategy of Implementation, the MSI, and the Samoa Pathway. ABAS provides a comprehensive 10-year roadmap it responds to challenges which didn't exist or have worsened since uh, Samoa was adopted in 2014. The ABAS is aligned with global frameworks such as the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework. The ABAS focuses on key areas such as, not such as, but definitely not limited to, economic resilience climate action, biodiversity, innovation, and health, all of which position SIDS to achieve a sustainable and resilient future through strong international partnerships and support mechanisms. We'll then look at the importance of SIDS for and ABAS. Um, it continues to hold a space for SIDS. This is what the ABAS does. And it's critical at a time, and I believe that the ambassador mentioned this, when so many, particularly within the UN negotiations in New York, COP negotiations, and even MFD negotiations are questioning um, the special circumstances of SIDS and encroaching on these um, special circumstances. ABAS continues the recognition first made at the Earth Summit in 1992 for the special case of SIDS. And it updates the action plan to current to reflect current realities and provide tailored solutions to SIDS and present issues. Moving on then to the objectives and goals of the BAS. Um, as mentioned, we look at economic resilience, scaling up climate and biodiversity efforts, as well as disaster risk reduction. So as relates to economic resilience, the ABAS aims to diversify SIDS economies beyond tourism and in ports by focusing on innovative, driven sectors such as renewable energy, digital transformation, and the new economy, which will lead to long-term resilience. 
as it relates to climate and biodiversity efforts, the vast renewed commitment to scaling up climate and adaptation and mitigation efforts, focusing on nature-based solutions, ocean resources, and marine biodiversity. As it relates to DRR, disaster risk reduction, the ABAS integrates disaster risk management into international policies to reduce the disproportionate impact of natural disasters on SIDS. This includes investment in resilient infrastructure and early warning systems. Additionally, health and social protection. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed weaknesses in healthcare and social safety nets. The ABAS aims to build more robust systems to protect communities from future crises. And also innovation and technology, the ABAS establishes the innovation and technology mechanism that is key for driving digital transformation and climate tech innovations that support sustainable development across states. We now look at VAS as a distinct framework. So the ABAS is in alignment with the global frameworks that I mentioned before. It complements international frameworks like the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and the framework, and it ensures that SIDS are fully integrated into global efforts to combat climate change and promote sustainable development. It also prioritizes global commitments while ensuring that SIDS are not lacking. It continues to maximize resources and efficiency, aligning the advanced with existing frameworks, allows it to leverage global resources. It also streamlines implementation by avoiding duplication of efforts and optimizing limited resources. It gives a distinct focus on six needs. Uh, as mentioned before, it offers a localized, tailored approach for SIDS, um, or some might say for us, by us, and focuses on immediate and long-term um, vulnerabilities. We move then to support and enabling factors for implementation. At the international level, we have debt sustainability support, as well as climate finance. There's also the global data hub. And then we have at the regional level, SIDS, SIDS cooperation, and things such as this is SIDS national focal point. So in conclusion, and to wrap up, our progress in, in advancing sustainable development goals is evident through the measurable impact of strategic collaboration and innovative approaches. We see the ABAS as a roadmap for SIDS resilient future. It provides a clear strategic framework to address the unique vulnerabilities of SIDS in today's context. It gives alignment with global frameworks. It aligns with the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and Sendai Framework, and ensures that global goals are adopted to are adopted or adapted to SIDS local needs. And it's also a call for collective action. It is a shared path towards resilience and sustainability, requiring strong partnerships and localizing efforts for a prosperous future for SIDS, where no one and no island is left behind. I thank you. Um, and just before handing over then to um, back to the moderator, and uh, just as we continue then this discussion this morning, we'll delve deeper into what it is that you as national local points can do um, and such things like that. So thank you once again for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. White, for unpacking uh, the Atlas of the Liberal Gym uh, for us. So now it's my uh, pleasure to uh, hand over the floor uh, to Jessica for your comments. Thank you, Andy, and Excellencies, colleagues, uh, good morning. Uh, as I am the last to speak on this particular panel, but, um, I am aware that there may be some overlap um, in the discussion, um, but some of it bears repeating, and uh, others um, bears a, a little bit more um, in-depth discussion. So I will start 
my presentation and forgive me, I have multiple tasks with um, a bit of setting the scene and attacking the Atlas, uh, building on the presentation with a bit before me. So the, the presentation will first be outlined in components with the ABA, which we won't need to go into uh, much detail on. Thank you to the reason for going into that and its tangible deliverable. And subsequently, I will discuss the alignment of the ABA the international, regional, and national framework, and which is critical for harmonized implementation. And then finally, I will reflect on drivers and challenges in the training ABA at the national level. So the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SIDS or the ABAS, um, we, we know that it was formally adopted at the fourth conference, fourth international conference of SIDS in May in Antigua and Barbuda, and it outlines the SIDS development priorities for the next 10 years. And of course, it builds on, as we said, the previous uh, blueprint for SIDS sustainable development, some more pathway, commercial strategies for further implementation, the way it runs up the way it Just to know here that um, the ABAS enjoys the full endorsement of member states, all of the member states of the United Nations, and its adoption signifies the international community's collective ambition to support the And uh, I won't go into much detail here because um, many much of this was said before. Um, so, but just to remind that the ABAS is in three main chapters. As, as was said before, and that it also includes the section on the role of the UN and on the Ebony framework, which we all uh, agree is a very important piece in the implementation. So, uh, here again, we go into some of the um, key focus areas of the ABA. And uh, uh, many of the, uh, the issues were already raised by my previous uh, by the previous speakers, but I just wanted to touch on a few, a few key priorities um, because they all speak to uh, how we will address uh, ABA implementation in particular uh, with respect to international other international framework. Uh, so some of them include the reform of international architecture when it comes to economic resilience. Supporting the debt sustainability and mainstreaming the MPI, the multi dimensional vulnerability index, into relevant policies and practices. And this is particularly important as we move to uh, adopt the MPI within the UN system and also advocate for its use with national institutions and the, uh, the multilateral development bank and beyond. Uh, we also want to speak to um, supporting the island connectivity, which I don't think was uh, touched on uh, previously, and linking the city to regional and global markets at the critical importance to economic diversification as well. Expanding city productive capacity, as well as advancing resilient and sustainable tourism. Those are some of the key uh, uh, priorities under economic resilience. We also have a focus, as was, as was said, on equal inclusive and productive population, climate action, disaster and risk reduction. And I won't go into the details again here. They are all in the ABAS for your further reading. Um, if you haven't already, some of us are well familiar <laughs> with the details of the ABAS. But again, the priorities around health and society, including biodiversity, science, technology, innovation, digitalization, we will speak on a um, session tomorrow, and of course, partnership, uh, which is a very key point in carrying the uh, of us agenda forward. So now I will move on to some of the more tangible outcomes of that activities are, have um, been touched on already as, as well. Um, the Swiss Center of Excellence, 
which includes the SIPS data hub, the technology and innovation mechanism, the Island Investment Forum, and the SIPS Debt Sustainability Support Service. I believe it's now being coined as SIPS uh, Debt Q or SIPS Debt SQ or something of that. That that remains. So we will hear more about these in Egypt tomorrow. We have a focal point here from that teacher talk to the whole year. We expect to go into more detail for that. So, with uh, respect to the monitoring evaluation framework, we will also have a section on that um, right after this one. So, we will go into more detail there as well. But paragraph 38 of that, that aims to develop a monitoring and evaluation framework with clear target indicators to be completed by no later than the second quarter of 2025. And this work, as was mentioned by the impact, that will be guided by an interagency task force. Uh, we have begun the work of the uh, interagency task force on its first meeting uh, last month. And we will go into more detail, as I said, in the coming session. But critical to the MA framework is that it's nationally owned and consultative and aligned with existing reporting mechanisms to avoid duplication. Our data will be collected in collaboration between SIDS and national statistical offices and the UN Regional Commission. And the NFMEs will play a key role in ensuring that the MA framework being developed aligns to the SIDS context. Going more into the alignment of the international frameworks. So, the, as, as was mentioned, you know, the objectives of the ABAS are closely, closely aligned to key international, regional, and national development frameworks. And this alignment will be explored in the coming slides with a view providing a basis for our consideration on how best to mainstream the ABAS, harmonize implementation efforts, and ensure coherence at all levels. And it should be noted that the framework. We must also consider the uh, framework at the regional level as a way to more mainstream in the ABAS and coherent implementation strategies. And the use of regional um, frameworks include the 2015 Blue Pacific Strategy, CARICOM, strategic.
uh, summarize and this can be summarized on the screen now. But again, this is, this is not meant to be it's not meant to be exhaustive, but instead it provides a basis for our discussion. So please, if you have any further feedback on these, uh, we are very um, happy to share yeah, those and include those in our discussion and further work. Thank you very much for the, uh, the whole, you know, the, the three speakers that have kind of set up um, our discussions up very nicely. Uh, so we actually have quite a, a generous amount of time uh, for our discussions until we bring uh, for morning tea uh, at 11 um, But if, the, I, think the, I think it's the pound that just a lot. But I think just this last slide was, really useful in terms of our discussions. Uh, and is it possible to pull up the last slide? Um, well, we've got... Don't do this because it's not 
I, I think one of the things also that we're going to be in mind tomorrow is certain actions that are uh, uh, taken at the regional level as opposed to national level. I think that's where the subsidiarity actually comes in. And, and just to uh, let you know, because I think that's time that particular question. In the context of uh, European aid, But the challenge, of course, is to ensure that that does not mean that those resources will not be replenished. They will have to be replenished. But what we are trying to do is to fast track implementation because resources have no.
the graduation at the national level and how monitoring at the regional level can also trigger some of these processes moving forward. So we're we'll going to look at those links um, and integrate them in the best possible way to ensure that we can identify with the forward so that we can then focus attention on those where the connections is more uh, in terms of whether it's financial assistance. Um, because I think as we move along, we need to do that. Otherwise, we won't be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Just to reiterate and reemphasize the point then um, that the ambassador made uh, as we talk about monitoring and evaluation, and that was something that we'll go into more detail uh, in the second session. Um, just to talk about how partners and perhaps help us if we think about this. So, mentioned in one of my slides, and so if I ask her to when we're talking about um, the establishment of the global data hub uh, that the ABAS calls for um, to enhance decision making by providing citizens with accurate and accessible data for better tracking um, of kind of infant resilience, et cetera. So this is something then that we would welcome um, assistance in helping out um, this data hub because even if we're talking about monitoring and evaluation with Knights of Fish and the team for getting the interagency task force up and running, um, to to have it without actually having the data that to to plug in or to find out what you're doing is something that would definitely be needed. So so we think about partners um, and partnering for that, um, and then also as it relates to since it's cooperation, um, something then that was mentioned that we'll talk about later is a DSSI um, or D cubed or D cubed. I will hear remember the new name about um, that was talked about um, that was spearheaded by Antonio Margarita in the Abbas. Um, a four pronged approach to, to dealing with debt, et cetera. Um, and also in terms of citizens cooperation, think of the citizens blue green um, knowledge transfer hub um, that's also being partnered um, with UNIDO um, and University of West Indies. Also, then looks at um, building building a hub to, to access, for citizen access information and then learn best practices. Um, so just wanting to like those things and then look forward to delving in deeper in the next sections. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Thomas and I'm from Lao. And I just wanted to thank the um, DPR for bringing up the, the data hub. And uh, just to echo our colleague from Trinidad and Tobago, think that uh, there are already things that we can build up on and, and make sure that we're not duplicating our effort. And then I just wanted to mention that we in the Pacific, we do have a Pacific data hub. Um, and also um, at the SDF level, I'm sure any of you are familiar with the um, with the uh, sort of country tailored uh, uh, dashboard that would be completely developed for for the uh, SDF country. And we were doing um, uh, like a number of consultations uh, earlier this year to to um, to populate those dashboards. And I just want to mention that um, perhaps that these are sort of existing uh, like mechanisms that we can work with rather than sort of starting from scratch and, and really ensuring how the uh, are um, can complement the, the the global data that I have the correct name for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mata. Want to take away the. The, the next session on data, but just to say that um, in the Pacific, we, we held our Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development on Tuesday and Wednesday last week, 
and if there is measures in there, and focus on the, you know, the four SDGs and the partnerships that will be the focus of the high level forum in July next year in New York. Every session that they, they highlight on that. Uh, and so we, as the Pacific office, we're going to go back to the drawing board and have a look at the client access. Because as we just said, there is a bit of assistance. There's, uh, you know, there is data available, there's many surveys, but somehow in the Pacific, we are not shifting the data. Uh, and I think maybe we are coming in at the level that you know, maybe our members are not finding up, but somehow we're just not hitting the nail like put it that way because every single meeting we have, they, they talk about that. Uh, so I got to the, the, the next session when we talk about that. I mean, I mean, I mean, that to, to the point you raised. Uh, firstly, there is no intention to replace existing regional or national data institution if they do exist. I think what we're talking about is the set global data. So that's it. That's the one way that it works. You need national institution and you need regional institution. And I think when you look at the issue of the FBI and one of the key areas where we did not have the data, that is the case. And one of the reasons is because of sovereignty of countries or the availability of data that can be made. So if anything is said, there will be areas where a collective decision on making available sensitive data is the only way to go for set. If we want to ensure that some of the issues that we are fighting for we have the evidence. So that is one of the key reasons why we're talking about a global set. Data. It's not the intention to replace uh, existing institutions, but what the intention is to strengthen those institutions. And I think we have a public foundation which has already agreed to provide the assistance, and that's up to regional and national institutions. To work out what their needs are, whether it's a class community, whether it's an infrastructure, that, that's an entire up to, it's not to replace what is already existing. I'm looking around again. So that is, is the coffee ready? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think people would like to have a break and stretch their legs, get a fresh air. So we're we're doing really good in terms of our 